name is Austin, the host of this show. Today we are doing something different from the traditional way of creating videos, and that we have a guest today, Giovanni, a facilitator from the IPSI program. Hello. Thanks for having me, Austin. Thank you for being here, Giovanni. Today's topic will be about COVID. Now, we've been in crisis for a while, Giovanni. How did your life change? Your work, social life, hobbies, exercise, pets? Oh man, well, I think there was a lot of things that changed, right? Um, in terms of my social life, I think things uh, definitely became more difficult. Like I was used to, you know, going out to see friends um, and things like that. And all of a sudden, I was only able to see friends over Zoom or under like very controlled circumstances where we had to social distance and wear masks, uh, which, you know, me and my friends always made sure to do um, just to make sure that everyone was safe. And yeah, so it was, it was difficult. And I think for me, like there was a bit of um, an emotional toll, you know, I think, um, I think that wouldn't be weird. Uh, that wouldn't be a weird experience for other people to, to have too where, you know, you're, you're feeling maybe a little bit isolated and uh, you're kind of stuck inside or um, it's not like you can go to your favorite restaurants or anything like no. that. You know, maybe a patio is open, but even that, you know, we typically did a lot of takeout. Um, I think for my pet, Jupiter, my cat, um, he didn't really see much of a difference. Well, actually, no, he probably saw a huge difference because I had to work from home. So he saw me a lot more. Um, so he was probably very happy about that. I like to think that he was. Um, so we got to hang out at home a lot more. Um, I'm trying to think what else, sorry, social life, pets, what, what, what was the other one? Hobbies, exercise. Oh, exercise was very difficult. Can't go to the gym. Right. And I was really worried about going to the gym, too. I don't know if you felt that as well, because um, I know that you also went to the gym or you go to the gym on a regular basis or you try to. I did until, uh, unfortunately, my gym closed and went bankrupt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I noticed a lot of the any times in Calgary were, were going bankrupt and kind of closing down. Um, I had to freeze my account. Um, but yeah, I would usually go to the gym at least like a few times a week. Didn't really do that anymore. Had to find very creative ways to work out and exercise at home. But it's a different environment. And I thought that was really hard because you don't really have the same motivation to work out at home because, at least for me, psychologically, the, you know, being at home means that, uh, or it, it becomes a place of comfort rather than of um, exerting all of my energy to try to, um, you know, exercise and you know, you don't have access to all of the machines and, or the, you know, the running machine or the ladder machine or anything like that. So it was very difficult. Um, had to get creative, you know, uh, using chairs and, you know, buying resistance bands at home and um, stuff like that. But it's really not the same and I really don't get the same kind of workout. So that, that was a huge change for me. I, I know for me, I... I've been reduced to uh, just using uh, dumbbells at home and uh, just going out for a walk. That's been basically my exercise. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and usually when you go to the gym, you, you have access to all of these different weights of dumbbells and, and barbells and stuff like that. But I only have like, you know, a couple eight pounds, a couple 20 pounds. Um, and then it's not really enough. No, in, in for some for some exercises, you know, if you're if you're doing, you know, an, an incline bench, you know, 20 pounds in each arm is probably not going to do it. So um, nor do I have a bench. So it makes it very, very difficult. You know, you're doing you're, you're doing a lot of push ups uh, yeah, to try the, to get the same on the floor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, no, it was it was definitely difficult. You do. We, we got a lot of walking. I learned my neighborhood very, very well from walking around. <laughs> Um, yeah. So, you know, every little detail, what your neighbors are up to now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm more familiar with like certain 
you know, certain places or little details about like the environment of the, of the neighborhood. Um, there's a bunch of houses that I just like really never noticed. I was like, hmm, that person has an, a very bright orange door and I never actually noticed that before. <laughs> or I was like, wow, that person must be a really great gardener. Look at all of these like beautiful flowers that they, uh, that they planted. So, yeah. you know, there's a lot of things that I just never noticed before because typically I would just be driving by. Um, but now I'm, I'm into yeah I never paid that much attention and now I'm intimately familiar with you know who has dogs and who doesn't essentially who to keep away from who not to lend stuff to <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah uh, how did you adjust to COVID well I had a lot more time to myself and I think working from home was um, was something that I wasn't uh, that I'd never done before. So it required me to hone my organizational skills, I think, um, and to stay on top of things in a different kind of way. But it was also very weird because my place of work is also my place of like creativity at home. So I have a desk at home where I would like do my drawings or I'd like, you know, work on projects on the computer or something like that. And now that's also like my, my work workspace. Yeah. Um, so now my workspace is actually a lot more messy. Um, and it's hard to sort of, I don't know, um, separate those two worlds. Now, although every, like my desk is where I do everything. It's where I work. It's where I play. It's where I do creative stuff. It's where I do everything. So um, yeah, and I think, I think maybe uh, when I was in school, that was sort of the same case, right? Like I'd be writing essays in the same place that I was maybe, you know, playing video games or something like that. So um, just more, more of that, but more intense. Yeah. Do you find yourself distracted by your artistic stuff while you're working? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because I try to, I, I try to set my desk up in a particular kind of way, um, so that I have access to things really easily. So you know, I have all my paintbrushes. I have like shelves of of paint. I have, uh, you know, tools like clippers and uh, uh, markers and thing like uh, alligator clips and all mm -hmm. sorts of like things that I would use to like. Um, spray paint things or do stuff like that so that I would um or I would take it outside to spray paint obviously but um but yeah, I have access to paper and notebooks and markers and all sorts of stuff that I'd be doing like right here and yeah. it's hard to and it's hard to you know be doing work but actually have every creative thing like right at at arm's reach so yeah hard to stay focused a little bit um but yeah, you, you do your best and you get you get your work done you try to <laughs> yeah yeah well if i don't get it done someone's gonna start emailing me <laughs> so <laughs> yeah so yes yeah, so, you know things still get done and i I can, I can still focus on work i usually use music to help me do that so i put my headphones in and that way i can kind of put my head down and make sure that i'm getting done what needs to get done right yeah yeah what That's about weird. you did you find that it was difficult to uh, for you to get your schoolwork done when you're uh... <laughs> uh well i'm gonna tell a lie and say no it was very easy <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think i think it's definitely it's it's something that everyone has is struggling with that's in some way i'm sure <laughs> no i have found it difficult i found myself uh distracted <laughs> by wanting to play um a game called AI Dungeon, where you just write. <laughs> mm, yeah, you actually told me about that before, and I and I actually tried it out. I thought it was a great tool. It's a great creative writing tool. Oh, it is. It's very distracting. Like, oh, I want to go uh, maybe write a few paragraphs and just create a character to see what the AI does with it. <laughs> you mm -hmm. forget about your schoolwork and other types of work. Yeah, I guess it... Uh... There's fun writing and then there's like school writing. So it's nice to take a break from your school writing and do some some fun stuff. It is, yes. Yeah, and you gotta take breaks too, right? On a regular basis. Cause sometimes it's it's difficult to focus on one thing that takes a lot of brain power for a long time. So, you know, 
taking breaks is normal, I think. It is, yes. How do you feel the provincial government in Alberta is handling COVID? <laughs> oh man, that's the that's the million dollar question. I think. I, well, I think. I think there's a lot of things about it that are fine, and but I think there's a lot of things that are kind of ridiculous. Like, um, what I've heard from some uh, friends of mine who have their own personal businesses is that they don't. They're not like giving them enough time to close down their shop so that they can relay that information to their clients adequately or like in the prop or in a, in a, in a adequate amount of time. So for instance, like if you are say a um, hairstylist and then all of a sudden, like the next day you have to close down, that means that you have to cancel all your appointments for the week um, or longer. Um, so you have to reach out to all of your clients. You have to let them know to postpone or to reschedule, but then you're not exactly sure when to reschedule for um, so in a lot of ways, everyone's just sort of like on the hook, just waiting to see what happens. Um, and I think that makes it really difficult for small business owners because um, their bread and butter is clients, right? Or, or appointments in, in a lot of cases, not mm -hmm. all cases, but, um, but if you have to, if you have to all of a sudden, you know, at the drop of a hat, reschedule your entire business, um, I think that thing that makes it very, very difficult. And you have to do that in a very tactful way, lest you actually like lose clients. Um, so I think there's a lot at stake for small businesses. Um, whereas um, the government seems to just sort of expect everyone to just drop everything with no, with no warning. Um, and then on the other side of things, um, you know, like I, th I think there is there's certain aspects where you kind of have have to ask like what are, like what data is some of these decisions make being based off of um, so for instance we can use the stampede as an example like right now right basically they made it so we know when the stampede is supposed to open and then they counted back from there um, yeah. to, for and and organized like phase one two and three from there. Um, but, you know, even, even months before that, or sorry, maybe it might even be a year at this point, but, you know, they weren't at sometimes, sometimes they're not closing down enough and then they're closing down too much. And then they're making people sort of have to adjust at the drop of a hat. And I think that it's, it's very, very difficult, especially when small businesses have to close down, whereas large businesses get to stay open. Um, and it seems, uh, it seems like it's difficult for everybody. So if you had to grade uh, Kenny's performance on handling COVID, would you give him an F or an A? Well, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of, a uh, bunch of letters in between there, but he's pretty close to an F because he's kind of an ass. So um, <laughs> I'm not, yeah, like, you know, you, you could literally um, make those decisions with no data. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, clearly he's, he's not, he's not using all the data that he's given um, or not asking for the right data. So yeah, I, I, I don't know. I just, I, I'm, I'm as a citizen, I'm disillusioned and uh, disappointed mm -hmm. for sure. Maybe not everybody is, but I can only speak for myself personally that um, yeah, it's annoying when um when cases are spiking and he's only deciding to close down like Pilates studios and things like that, like just really like, you know, and like gyms and, and stuff like that, where it's like, you're, you're just not closing down enough and you're just sort of like half-assing the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so, but, but I understand like there are certain uh, limitations and certain things that he's, he's valuing over other things. Um, but I don't think, no matter what, at the end of the day, you shouldn't be sacrificing um, human health for economic, like, it's not even growth, but the, you know, for, for the economics side of things, right? Like, I think um, the social side of things should, um, should trump some of those economic things. Yeah. Sorry, that word is poisoned now, but I use it anyways. <laughs> 
Yeah. Does that make sense? I don't think, I don't know if I'm articulating myself really well, but I think oh, that's, that makes sense. Ge- that's generally how I feel about it. I don't, I don't feel good about the whole thing. And there's a lot of things that are just really, really silly. And at the end of the day, like get finding, you know, getting pictures where they're like going on vacation or, uh, <laughs> or like there's pictures where like, they're not even social distancing and they're not even following their, their own rules is, you know, it, it, it makes you just sort of like, you know, question the, their capability and their integrity at the end of the day too. So, yeah, just like the uh, recent uh, news about Kenny, about him enjoying a nice dinner on top of a roof. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with uh, with uh, you know enjoying dinner on a patio, right? Well, except but when you're like right next to your to your guys, right? Yeah, and. I'm not sure if he was doing it during the lockdowns or not. Because I think there, he was being questioned by some of his ministers. Uh, why are you doing this? Yeah. And, and I think at the end of the day, like the big thing is, you know, if you are a major player and like a, a, a decision maker, um, like you're also a role model. Yeah. Right. Oh, so if, if people are supposed to be looking to you for an example, um, then you should be acting like it. And if you're not someone like, or if, or if you're making the argument that that, or if people who are decision makers shouldn't be looked at as a role model, my question is like, why are they in that position? Oh, exactly. Why do, why do we bother electing them? Yeah, exactly. So I always, I always like to think of like, uh, you know, well, <laughs> It's kind of a random aside, but, um, and I know there's plenty of uh, problems with, with, you know, the golden age of Athens and, and democracy back then, because there's plenty of corruption and slavery and things like that. But um, I just keep thinking of, um, they had like the boule, which is it's part of, um, they had a, a level of the political decision-making that where they would randomly assign like a, a large group of people to be representatives um, and to also make decisions, but mm-hmm. because they were randomly selected, they were worried about, uh, or they were randomly selected because it would avoid like sort of a group think mentality and like kind of party systems. Yeah. It, it, it would sort of avoid those things where people don't get sort of entrenched in their own position, but rather um, realize they have a responsibility um, as citizens, um, as an individual, not just, you know, as part of some um, affiliation of a larger group. Mm -hmm. Um, And they have a responsibility to their fellow citizens. So anyways, again, I'm I'm aware that was occurring in a flawed system as well. But um, I always like the the sentiment of that sort of like personal agency for um, active citizenship. I think it's important. And, you know, you're, you're a role model. Oh, exactly. Everyone. And if you're in a position of power, then you should act like it. You should, yes. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of Kenny's handling of the vaccine rollout? I don't really know. I, I, there's a lot of information about this that, like, I'm not, I don't really know about. Um, but I did get my first dose of the vaccine at the TELUS Convention Center, and I didn't think that that was a failure at all. I thought that was um, pretty well organized, actually. Um, I did make an appointment. I went in, you know, there's a lot of like, like there's a lot of sort of uh, walking around and kind of finding the right place. But basically at every corner, there was someone who was like really nice um, to guide me along. And they reminded me to, to pay, to pay for parking and, <laughs> um, or to get a parking uh, ticket. I didn't actually have to pay for it, but um yeah, and then eventually, like, I got there, and it was, like, well-organized, although it felt, like, really surreal, because it felt like this is what, this is what a pandemic looks like in a movie. Yeah. You know, you have, like, you kind of walk into this huge place, um, and it's sort of set up to, you know, give, you know, provide vaccines to as many people as possible, as quickly as possible, and as well-organized as possible. So, um, yeah, so I, I ended up going to the TELS Convention Center. But yeah, I thought, I thought that was a great job. But um, 
I don't really know what limitations they had in terms of like how quickly they got vaccines. I don't know if you have more information on that. Uh, I know there was some issues in the beginning with the Ontario getting most of the vaccine and uh, the West uh, kind of being left out. And I know that uh, Kenny, I think Kenny made some agreement with Montana and has taken some of their vaccine, their uh, excess vaccine and brought it here. And I also know that uh, Joe Biden in the US uh, made promises to send, send some of their excess vac vaccine here as well. Well, yeah, no, it's good. I didn't, I, again, like personally, I know that there's a lot of like pharmacies that were, um, you know, they would, they would get their vaccines or whatever. And I think they would run out quite quickly because people were going to their, to their local pharmacies. Um, yeah. So personally, like I didn't, I didn't notice anything about the vaccine, but I, I'm not really aware of like the entire schedule or anything like that either. Um, but I have been looking at some of the schedule for like dose two and it seems like um, it's sort of like staggered as well. Like for instance, if you got your, if you got your first dose, like in March, then you could get it July, f June 1st. And then if you got it in April, then you could get it June 14th or something like that. So I think there's just some maybe uh, medical complexities where they have to make sure that, you know, you, your body has worked up enough uh, immunity or, or gained enough antibodies to before the next dose. I don't, I don't really know. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't know how vaccines work. <laughs> <laughs> Only the professionals do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. 